and like putting all of the sound in one millimeter of tape. It's kind of hard to read back that way. Okay. We have been uh, looking at Ray. And Ray is the center of all of mythology and all of cosmology and all of religion to the Egyptians. We began uh, by looking at the two creation stories in Egyptian mythology, or two variants of one creation story, which sounded suspiciously like the two creation stories in the Bible. And then we looked for a while at the basic character of Ray, that is, of light. And we looked at light in terms of power. And we looked at the cycle of light, which is consequently also the cycle of darkness. We looked some at the Ray as the sun in the underworld, the Tuat, during the uh, nightly journey through the 12 pylons, or the 12 gates of the underworld. And then we looked at the light half of the cycle, and we looked at Ray or Amun Ray as the hawk soaring to the midheaven, which we also looked at as a mountain. And we saw that the rising sun rising out of the underworld or out of the land of darkness was driven by needle power and this was Ray Kepera, the beetle god, and this was the god of rejuvenescent life, but also of ascendancy in power. That was as it climbs, instead of it is not only seen as soaring up to the heights, it was seen as climbing a mountain, and that was called Mount Baku. Then we saw Ray descend the mountain, and in descending the mountain, it was Mount Manu. And uh, it was then Ray Tem, or Atem, which is where Adam comes from, and we saw that they had the same idea of Manus as the Hindus did when we were looking at Hindu mythology, that they were all sons of God, and that they were progenitors of humans in successive waves, and that they were that the humans that most represented Ray Tem were divine kings. They were seers and they were great spiritual beings. The uh, then we were we began talking more about other three pouts or trinities of Ray, and we looked at uh, Ray being born out of the inert watery mass of the abyss, Nu, and that he was the son of Nu, and that immediately upon being self-born, he masturbated and swallowed his own masturbation, and from what came out of him, at one end came uh, Tefnut, and the uh, excrement out of his spit, out of the other end was Shu, and they formed the primal trinity, so all in the same moment that he was, uh, this is, Freud would love it. <laughs> this is really polymorphic infantile sexuality, if you ever saw it. In the moment he was born, he masturbated, and uh, he uh, spit out and urinated out heaven and earth, or Purushra and Prakiti, uh, and uh, he became the manifest son then. He was self-born, and then there was that unusual thing that we're going to look at later. In the same moment that Shu and Tefnut were born, he was both became the radiant son, but he became obscured. 
then uh, we're at what we want to look at now. And this is something unusual. Ray was spontaneously self-conceived. But at the same time he was spontaneously self-conceived, there were two others that were also spontaneously self-conceived. Only the whole details are told of their birth in the creation story as it is with Ray. They are they, they're coetaneous, coeval. They exist all the time with Ray, and they are his constant companions. And uh, they just sort of came into being at the same time. And these two beings are Ma'it. And Tehudi, or Tehudi. This is, was grecified into full and further grecified into Hermes. And so this is the, uh, Tehudi is the Greek Mercury. So the first time, you know, is the little bits of the story come out in different places. When Ray was self-created in the watery mist, uh, uh, mass of the abyss, he was created with his boat at the same time. And immediately on both sides of the boat were Ma'it and Tihuri. And they were the guiders of the boat, but each one guided in a little bit different way. So every day as the boat went into the underworld and it had to be guided through the darkness and all the perils of Apep, the serpent of darkness, and all of the evil souls of the underworld, and they had to hold away the humans that were going to ask for the divine blessing of Ray. Uh, all of this, in, in all of this time, Ma'it and Tihuti were constantly with Nu, always together. Never, They were never apart, whether it was the daily cycle or the monthly cycle or the annular cycle or the long 1,400-year cycle of surface. They were always together. So from this, this is the, the way they appeared. They just sort of floated to the surface of the melted waters of Nu. Very much the feeling of the story is like the uh, creation story we saw with the Hindus where Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiv floated to the surface of the great ocean and there was nothing created. And Shiv was going to do this great creation and uh, he dives into the water and goes underneath. And he's gone for hundreds of years and while they, they get uh, anxious that he's ever going to do any creating at all, so in the meantime, uh, Brahma has Vishnu go through a creation. Only Krishna, Vishnu does it all his own way. And only the final touches are put on by Shiv. So that same kind of thing, the spontaneous self-creation, which was called a floating to the surface by the Hindus, was seen as a self-conscious act that one by, by the Egyptians. It is a alone begotten or a self-begotten or a self-conceived uh, quality, activity. Now since even though it appears to be a casual incidental association, nothing is purposeless. And if Ray is continuously uh, surrounded by these beings who were born the same way he was, that, uh, you know, it's a much different kind of creation than the dramatic creation of Shu and Tefnut. And because Shu and Tefnut represent the phenomenal creation, 
how things came to be externalized, the more transcendental creation is a self-creation. Now, since all of us are trying to be twice-borns, we're trying to be born not only in the physical, as we have been already, but we're trying to be born and reborn continuously in a transcendental sense so that we are born in the spirit. And this is a process of self-conception, of self-becoming, self-birth. We want to look at this myth because it will give us some hints about this process in the cosmos as well as in ourself. Because even though it seems that we are born almost by accident spiritually, or that it is by a blessing of God, there is still a large part that we have to play in the process of being spiritually born. But the activity that we do, it's not like shoveling or rowing a boat or something like that. It's it's a transcendental action, and it's much more indirect and not quite uh, the way you learn to dance by putting footprints on the floor. Uh, so let's look a little bit at this kind of uh, um, at this kind of concep conception. Ma'at is continuously associated with Tihuri, so much so that she is almost considered a counterpart to him. Though there is nothing that ever says that there was a bound relationship to them. They both took one side, of, each took one side of the boat as it went through the various different realms, and the boat is very clearly a vehicle of consciousness. And the trinity between uh, Ma'at and Tehudi represent the guiding principles in our transcendental consciousness that guide our whole vehicle of consciousness. The power and the basic being of uh, spirit, whether it be the Almighty One or whether it be each of us as one, is represented by Ray. But the threefold quality of manifestation, the actual carrying out or the vehicles of consciousness for that power to be accomplished and become are indicate, indicated by Ma'id in Tihuri then. So they were both very, very faithful, very, very long-suffering, especially Ma'at. Now, there are a lot of interesting, really interesting things, and some of the, <laughs> some of the interpretations you're going to get here are going to sound a little bit wild uh, compared to whether the rest of the world is concerned. But Ma'at had as her uh, symbol the ostrich plume. And she was always associated with the ostrich. Now, this is a symbol that in all religions seems to have universally the same meaning, but uh, probably in the figure of Ma'at, the symbol is more clearly seen than anywhere else. The uh, feather is rain mint, beautiful rain mint of any kind that you can think of. It's the it's resplendent adornment. And in that regard you can say that the feather represents the external expression of the divine beauty of the spirit. Whether it is you're talking about the threefold spirit of uh, Ray, 
or whether you're talking about an individual entity. So the feather has always represented that. But here again, immediately, as soon as there is an external expression, and the more rare and beautiful it is, every expression automatically becomes a concealment. So that in the same way that Shu and Tefnut uh, hide ray, the plumage of Ma'at also hides ray. It's like saying that any time you express yourself, you make very clear what you are, and you manifest this again and again. And it, what you are stands there as being very beautiful. It is the dress, you might say, of your being, without which your being would remain dark and never known. But once it's expressed, then it, be, then it hides you, because it introduces new mysteries, and it covers up the essential hidden nature of spirit so that you can't see it. So, strange as it might seem, light is almost the illusion of God. Because light is the expression of divine truth, of divine spiritual being, and the intensity of that light and the clarity of that light and the creative power of that light directly represents the spirituality of any being. That for seers there is no doubt about who has a greater spirituality than another as far as attainment is concerned, because you could just look and the one that had the brightest light uh, would clearly be the most attained spiritually. But by the same activity, of expressing that light, it becomes the illusion. Now, mind you, on the level of Ma'at and Tihuti, the, light, the illusion is extremely rare and extremely close to the divine nature of the spirit, but it is nonetheless an illusion. So even the truth or the, the most wonderful understanding or the most wonderful manifestation that anyone can see on any level of spiritual attainment that is spiritual light. Even that is an illusion to the invisible power or being that is behind it. Now it's really interesting because there is an evolution you know, these things are all reflected because the feathers are on phenomenal birds that we see in the world. And this is this whole principle, you know, I don't know how to say it. The principle that is light that becomes color in the divine is manifest in various other beings in evolution too. You know that before it was a feather, it was a scale on either a first a fish, and then later a reptilian type of body. And after it was a feather, it became hair. And so that uh, the whole idea of the divine regenerating itself or re-expressing itself through continuous manifestations of the light without which uh, no creation could continue to exist is seen in the whole evolution of the animal kingdoms. It's seen by animals that throw off their scales or animals that molt and throw off their, their uh, feathers and uh, human beings or uh, mammals that actually throw off their hair and uh, replenish new hair. So I, this leads me to believe that literally that if a person were very highly spiritual, they would indeed be bald. Because <laughs> that uh, it would indicate that there would be, not, there would be no more uh, of arraignment. You would have thrown it all off and you would be yourself when you say uh, like something is a bald-faced lie. Something like that would be for the divine also. 
baldness would indicate that there was uh, an invisible, uh, that that there was nothing uh, that was hidden anymore. It was all shining forth. Maybe I ought to become a skinhead and shine, the, the light could shine off my head or something like that. But at any rate, the feather had another universal meaning, and that is because of its lightness and its buoyancy. Sometimes a feather can stay in the air for a long time by the updrafts and crossdrafts in the wind. It was always representative of soul stuff, the material or the stuff of soul. And you might say that in the same way that ray represents power, the stuff of power is represented by might, and what is ma uh, made of that stuff, remember when we talked about divinities as being creators, uh, emanators, and fabricators. The emanation is like the feather is like the emanation, but it's also true of soul material that what comes out of the experiences that we perform, out of those experiences comes an essence. And it is a soul material. It's like saying that the divine emanates things and then things are compounded. And out of those compounds, they go through all kinds of transmutations and such. And out of that experience, the essence is withdrawn and it goes back as soul stuff back to the emanatory source and it becomes basically the food for the new creative powers of the spirit. Well, that soul stuff has always been indicated by the, uh, uh, by the feather in mythology. And, uh, hmm, how do you say it? When we say we learn something and we get the feel of it, that there is something about the nature of experience that when we feel it, either like feeling it in an external perception or feel it by being inside of it, both of those two qualities have to do with the second attribute of divinity, which is the attribute of feeling. And that is what is indicated by my it. And the feeling of all of our experience is the way when we re-feel or when we re-experience something so that we feel the essence of it. That is how soul is built back into the, um, uh, back into the soul or into, I should say, back into the spirit. Now, this carries out all the way through. I, I brought the, Dan insisted that we have this here. This is the Hall of Justice. Sometimes it's called the Hall of Might. And this is the journey of someone, uh, they call them the dead, the, the ignorant call them the dead, but it's the candidate for initia initiation that is being brought into the Hall of Justice. And in the Hall of Justice, the soul is weighed on this scale, and the monkey god sits on top of the scale, and Anubis, who is uh, Kerberos of the Greeks, Hermanubis is the same as Kerberos, it's a, one of those things where the sound got screwed up, and the, here is Tehudi measuring or, or writing down what is happening in the weighing of the soul in this little pot, which is shaped like the heart, is where the soul of the, in, of the individual, the initiate or the dead, is being weighed, and it's being weighed against the feather. And if your soul is heavier than a feather, you don't make it, and the devourer of souls uh, gobbles you up, and you get put into the pits of fire and things like that. But if you make it, uh, you become uh, Horus, and this is the hawk, Horus the hawk. Remember we talked last time about the eye of Horus brings you before the uh, 
before Osiris as the god of the dead and the judge of the dead, and you uh, uh, then are blessed to become a twice-born and to be, be reborn in the spirit. But the whole notion, this is called Ma'it's balance. And uh, the justification of anything that you do in life is to be weighed in Ma'it's balance. And uh, uh, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is a quality of justice where the weighing is not so much a telling of whether you're just, but it is a telling of what, whether what is in your heart, the experience that is a consequence of all of your dealings, everything that you've done, your deeds and such like that, the process of weighing is a process of vibration. Where, or libration, where you bring it across and bring it into the soul. So what I'm trying to say is that the soul as the quality of feel in the threefold spirit is indicated by ma it and the feather and that which gets built into the spirit for new life is also indicated by the feather Soul in both of those senses are tied together with might. Now, if you think about it, the ostrich is a huge, big bird with very, very strong legs. And this is, this you find common to both, uh, Ma'it and Tehuti is that they are both symbolized by long-legged birds. And the long-legged birds means that they are risen far above the ground. They're birds, meaning that they can fly, that they can fly into the realm of the spirit. And that they're long-legged means that they're very far removed from the earth. And this was a symbolic way of the ancient Egyptians to say that they were transcendental. If it were a short-legged bird, uh, like we're going to look at the next time in a couple of weeks, the vulture, uh, then it was a bird that was much more close to nature. So, but the long-legged bird represents something transcendental. But a long-legged, uh, very, very uh, thick-legged bird represents, you know, like a, an ostrich is no small creature. It's big and it's strong. It'll, it'll uh, a human being doesn't stand a chance against it at all because it'll kick you and it'll beak you and either way it, it can wipe you out very quickly. Uh, the, uh, when, when Rajneesh had that commune uh, in Oregon, they had a lot of problems with coyotes for their uh, farm animals and things like that. And so they put ostriches out. And the ostriches took care of the coyotes. They kept them away. They're, they're really mean. You know. But the huge, big size of it, if you were, if you wanted to look at the uh, threefold spirit, the divine spirit or ray would be an indefinite circle that was infinite. And then a larger circle within that would be the life spirit symbolized by might. And then the focus would be the little tiny point circle would be Tihuti. And so, like, when you're talking about a big-bodied bird, that's what this is. That, that's, you know, in a symbolic representation. That's why the ostrich was chosen and why the little skinny-legged bird the very, with a the, with the very skinny pointed beak is uh, the ibis. Uh, Tehuti is represented by the ibis, and it's skinny. It's when the broader focus of the spirit has become more concentrated and focused through the process of thinking. So, and this really is quite uh, interesting uh, because this answers a lot of questions. You, you know the uh, you know the common lore about ostriches burying their head. This, if you look at it with this meaning. <laughs> With the ostrich burying its head, you've got the tetrahedron. Uh, 
that this is again the whole concept of spiritual perfection. Literally, you have then a ball at, you know, like the, 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 the fire is always seen at the top of the triangle in the perfected spirit with the uh, eye in the center, but you have the tetrahedron. And it's really interesting because the, it, it's, it's backwards now because they say that the ostrich hides its head in fear, but it's most likely in impartiality because it can't see when it has its head. And when Ma'at is seen, seen, for example, in Greek mythology, it's seen as Themis, the goddess of justice, who's blindfolded with the scales. Also a Venusian type of divinity that's associated with love and feeling and all those long-suffering qualities. And so the quality of the ostrich with its head buried in the sand is a tetrahedron, and it is a tetrahedron representing the blindness or the impersonality of the spirit. How does the Bible say it? God is not a respecter of persons, that everyone is treated equally and that there is a kind of uh, a very rock-solid love that is associated with the divine spirit or with the crystallium, as the uh, Greeks called it, that it was a crystal of light that was pure light, and that kind of love and quality was uh, very, very impersonal. So, the feather not only represents what is right, like soul material, but it indicates what is even more subtle than itself. It indicates air. Because you never think about the feather unless without thinking about air. And so air, as we know from astrology and from uh, all of the things that are attributed to it, is associated with intelligence. And from the other things we know, that we know that this is a feeling-like kind of intelligence. And therefore, when Ma'at is symbolized by the feather, and the feather represents air, and the whole soul quality is associated with feeling, this is giving us a really clear picture of the part of the spiritual world's and of our own spiritual being that is pointed to by Ma'at. It is the source in our being or in the cosmos of all intelligence. But it is not an intelligence that is specified by thought. It is more like an intelligibility. It is a solid truth that is uh, not at all delineated. And this quality then is associated with the life spirit or the buddhic quality in the East. And it is like what we breathe. The air that we breathe has moisture in it. And uh, that is like the breath of life, but life with a capital L. And so then the expression of the divine raiment is like the outbreathing of light in the form of truth, but it is a kind of light that is intelligible and it's filled with feeling for life, and it has a moisture in it so that all things can be created out of it. And this represents a state of our being from which thoughts become, a state that has a feeling, as we saw when we looked in the Hindu mythology, it is the feeling that holds things together and the para-imagination that uh, makes all other imaginings possible is that whole integral, holding together, feeling type of quality. Thus, we find 
in ma'et then a being that is something like the nous, N-O-U-S, of the Greeks, and that breath of uh, intelligible life. Now, uh, all right. Remember, we're, we gotta we gotta have uh, mnemonics here, and remember that we're trying to get to the fact that this quality of feeling of intelligible truth that holds things together in an impartial way and that breathes itself out is fundamental to the act of self-becoming. That unless we can realize this in ourselves and bring our attention to this part of our being, we cannot be twice borns in our own in, a, in, a, in our own selfhood. Now I have all sorts of little tiny asides. Some of the things physically uh, about might are extremely hard to, with hundreds of Egyptologists for several centuries, like one of the hieroglyphs for Ma Eight looks like this. And there have been and even contextually uh, you there it it is not clear what that uh, what that uh, hieroglyph is and it's very difficult to deduce. And some people have been certain from the way that the hieroglyph looks uh, that it was a wedge. And other people were certain that this was an Egyptian flute. And other people were certain that it represented a cubit uh, or some kind of standard. All of the above seem to coincide when we talk about the uh, nature of um, ma'et or the nature of the life spirit. It's a funny thing that uh, from the transcendental sense, words existed before thoughts. And it's just the other way around in the phenomenal sense that the thought exists before it is given utterance in the word. Uh, we have said it a number of times before that things come into manifest beings when they become specific, when they become atomic. That is, when the universal concept of a spirit being everywhere becomes something like an atom, that is the manifest nature of it. Now, Cosmologists in the mysteries of all ages, East and West, ancient and modern, have had the notion of contiguous points in spiritual space. And those contiguous points are very much like mathematical space. That there, it's continuous. There really is no break and the differentiation of points in mathematical space is an intellectual concept. This atomization, or the externalization as the thought, or as the world, or as the thing, is indicated by Tehuti. But the organization, the intelligent organization and discrimination of atoms and their relations to each other, and you can use it in a very physical type of analogy, but I don't know how far it carries. The setup work is done by ma'et or by the life spirit. That is to say that when a creation takes place, there are different worlds, different realms, and those different realms are delineations of the character of God in different states of being. And according to one picture or one analogy, 
what differentiates the different planes from each other, this is only an analog picture, is the inclination of the axis of all of these contiguous and continuous atoms that everything at one inclination that is set spinning represents one plane. And these planes are all interpenetrating and I'm sure that there's something between the inclination of the axes of these theoretical atoms because I don't want to say that they're physical because it's so hard when you're talking about realms that are so transcendental that they're beyond our thinking. It's very hard to think of them uh, literally as being uh, physical atoms. The way they are set up so that one plane interpenetrating another so that another one would have its inclination uh, in a different way and it would all be part of the same plane, that is done by the word. The word is the outbreath that organizes things so that the atoms are set on their inclinations and set spinning. The uh, Shiv principle or the Fohat principle is Tihuti and that is the spinner. Shiv is the lord of the dance and that's what actually brings the planes into existence. But it's sort of like we look at this, the great serpent, this is the picture of the sun's path on the earth as the earth is spinning and going around, uh, uh, going around, as the earth is going around the sun. But it is, it's, it's like the spin and the orbital revolution that causes the wave that is the word. But in reality, it is truly the other way around. In the cosmic creation, the word is spoken. And as it is spoken, it, you know, the, uh, do you know the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves? Longitudinal waves are waves that, uh, uh, go out like like a wave on the water is a longitudinal wave, uh, a transverse wave, I'm sorry. A longitudinal wave is, it just goes in and out, and it makes its way forward, but it's it, it, you don't have the picture of the wave. Uh, I don't know how to say it, in the waveform that we're used to it. Like um, light, as we understand light in the physical world by physics, is a uh, transverse wave. The uh, sound is a uh, longitudinal wave. That's why when sound comes at you and there's a burst, it's like a shock wave that comes at you. If you think of the word that is in the life spirit or even much higher in the spiritual realms because this Trinity is reproduced on higher and higher levels or reproduced on lower and lower levels the way that it should really be. It is a continuous life that is like breath that's flowing in and out at all times. And this is an intelligent emanation, but it's emanating and back emanating at the same time. And it is an expression of the intelligence as intelligibility of the divine. And that word is what, in fact, sets up the angle of the axes as an intelligent discrimination, which is associated with the uh, uh, sign Virgo in, in astrology, because Virgo rules uh, both the uh, virgin, which represents the uh, uh, feminine life spirit uh, of the threefold trinity, and it represents the ability to uh, understand pitches. Uh, Virgo has a very puristic quality about pitches, and that is that wave that is emanated in a in a virgin-like type of creation. And the virginity has that whole quality of the ostrich that has its head in the sand. It is impersonal. It doesn't get involved directly in the creation itself. It creates the stuff 
of creation and it creates the life of creation and it is a virginal, impersonal kind of creation and in that it sets up what become the specific atoms or particulate thought. It is like thought comes out of a wisdom and that wisdom existed before the thought did and so the whole quality of the flute as being a standing wave that uh, is in the most rare realm of manifest spirit that can be perceived by the spiritual eye. It's, it, the standing wave is indicated, it carries as far as the limitation of the divine can express itself as an act of will and its own limitation is what breathes it back in on itself. I don't know how to say it any other way. It's when, now all of this sounds almost insane because you're talking about things that are so... so <laughs> maybe it is insane. I, I sometimes wonder about it at all. Well, did it, did we oh, did we... What? Oh, did we run out of tape already? Oh, my. No, it stopped. No, it isn't. An example of a standing wave be taking a rope, tying it yeah. to the door handle. Yeah, it. yeah, that's a that's a standing wave. Okay, if we look at it as the wedge, the wedge is a cutting device, and in the same way that the trine, which represents perfect can only be perfect when it has that virginal, non-involved type of quality. Of slang uses, you know, a lot of the same slang that we use is the same, it comes, keeps coming back again and again and again. A lot of the same slang we use was used by Shakespeare. And uh, it has been uh, continuously reborn. But when jazz musicians say, oh, I can cut him, meaning to say I can do everything he does and I can do things beyond that. That's basically what you're saying about my it in terms of knowledge that is capable of knowing. Knowing in the sense of nasos, nasos. Not in terms of a factual knowing, uh, but in terms of a knowing uh, in spiritual consciousness or spiritual perception. This represents then as a wedge or a knife blade, it represents the ultimate of subtlety. Because when it comes to the power of ray relative to ma'it, that power is basically invisible. And it can be sensed, but it can only be sensed through the light, and it can be only be sensed through that which cuts everything else. And the final image of the hieroglyph of uh, Ma'et is as a standard, as a cubit. And this fits into the uh, whole nature of Ma'et. When we judge something by the perfect, that perfect is just like the ostrich which must replume year after year after year, there is no constant perfect. It is something that is continuously reborn, like the light is continuously reborn, like the breath of life that is light is continuously reborn. It is a standard that we can apperceive. We know that there is that truth, but it isn't known in the sense of a measurable standard like a, like a cubit is. I don't know how to say this. It is in the same way that we have a visible standard, like, you know, like you, or they, we have the uh, weight, the uh, metal weight. This is the standard that everything else is measured against or we have something that is so long without we measure it by wavelengths of light, and then that's what tells us how long something is. We take a natural standard. That standard seems constant 
and it seems unchanging. Now, if we think, I don't know how to say it any other way, but if we take the picture of waves that are easier to picture, uh, like the regular wave of water, and if we think of an infinite number of them emanating out and coming back in, and that they are present in a life that folds back in on itself, and it has this lemniscat quality of being both positive and negative. Uh, I'm, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the uh, picture of the primordial atom as the caduceus of Mercury. Is something like a lemniscat spiral. Well, I shouldn't have done it that way. <laughs> which is, this would be the core of the lemniscat spiral, which would also wrap around and be a very large lemniscat spiral, which would be like a heart with a core in it. But on each of these lemniscat spirals would be spirals, with, and then there would be spirals within spirals within spirals. All of this represents the journey of Ray. It represents the complete expression of evolution where the consciousness is both delineated and cyclical where it comes back on itself. So the line and the circle meet in the lemniscat spiral with both the positive and negative flowing back on each other. This whole plan, the whole path, the whole way is there before there is any traversing around it. This is a constant standard. And the only thing that changes is the awareness from going through the experience of the whole spoken word of the whole path of the primordial atom. But from the consciousness of the life spirit, it is constant. It's there all the time. Remember when we said a long time ago that the memory of nature that is in the life spirit is constantly refreshed, that the, everything that has ever been experienced is alive and is always alive in the life spirit, and it isn't something that leaves an impression behind. It's continuously recreated, and it's all within that light of intelligibility. And in that same way, there is a standard that is the way of evolution that was there from the speaking of the word. The word was there even before it was spoken. Now, whether this is something that is in the absolute, that is even beyond ray or beyond the divine spirit in the ultimate unspeakable darkness, I don't know. Or whether it is there only as potential, but the word is there before the word is spoken. It's just like in the mystery schools in Christianity, we say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. The beginning with a capital B represents the absolute. And the Word was there in the beginning, even before it was ever spoken or ever expressed, and became the spinning. So what we're talking about trying to get back to our theme for tonight, if we're talking about self-becoming, somehow we have to refocus or better defocus. To be twice born, we have to realize that there is something of us that is ma'at, that is there before we were even differentiated as unique atoms, so to speak, as unique points within the all one point. 
And the self-becoming or the self-birth is awakening to that which is already there. Uh, what I'm trying to say, this, this represents a spiritual activity that you could call faith in one way, or you could call it a forgetting of self in the individuated sense and a remembering of that in which self is born. And when, you know, this, this is absolutely, you, you, have, you have to, uh, I don't know how to say it, you have to die to yourself to be born in yourself in the truly uh, self-born state. Uh, I think I've bitten off more than I am capable of uh, bringing all the way through. But, uh, but you understand then that uh, this, uh, there is a realization where one lets go. And when one lets go, one then can experience the selfness of selfhood from its own state. And that letting go is really, I don't know how to say it, it's, it's all paradoxical. It's, a, uh, it's actually a grasping at something that is really eternal that can only be done by letting go. Uh, we're at the realm of life spirit, which is like the London Scat. It's paradoxical. It is uh, called that which is straight, but it's also curved at the same time. It's where straight lines curve and meet, or where parallel straight lines curve and meet. And it's a conception of conception, and it is the truth of truths, as the Egyptians would say. So there is a polarization, as there always is with the second. Number two is the pole. And uh, there is a paradoxical polarization, but that paradoxical polarization is still unified such that the differentiation into paradoxical opposites is united in the one, and it flows back into itself. All right. So my eight, beside all of that, represents everything that is just, everything that is right, everything that is truthful, everything that is good, and everything that is honest. Because even though we've been speaking about this as a pathway of attention, or a word that one listens into existence, that, that the listening and the speaking are the same thing, but one hears, the, hears it into existence. I don't know how to say it. Uh, that true speech in the spiritual sense is a hearing. In your deepest meditations, when you can get in touch with the, uh, even the most distant echo of the creative word, the, you, you yourself speak it into existence by hearing it. Uh, so there it is not just a wave, and it's not just a light. As we were saying earlier, there is a quality of feel to it. And that quality of feel is the quality of a divine love, of a divine goodness, and of a divine justice. So that one feels one's way along the path, and even though you're at the very essence of light, you're feeling yourself along like a blind person. You know what I mean? Like the ostrich with its head buried. And in that whole business, it is a feeling of never departing from that which is right or never departing from that which is straight. And that's why this whole concept of the feel of the nature of the divine word is very much like the order that is called Dharm in the Orient. The Dharm itself continuously refreshes itself. It is continually setting itself right. And uh, 
this is the kind of conception that we are trying to discover in ourselves through the concept of uh, Ba'it. This, when it be, is given, when this word is given a name, this was symbolized by all Gnostics, meaning people who know and who know by having experienced this. This was called the name that is above all names. So that in Paul's writings in the uh, letters when he talks about Christ Jesus having a name that is above all names, he is pointing to this principle. He's pointing to this being because it is the name from which or the word from which all other names come. And that brings us to a very important quality. Not only is the, does this have a quality about it or a feel about it, it has a character. And that character is the epitome or is the very life of truth. It's the very life of justice. It's the very life of beauty that is the whole organization of the cosmos. And that character is what is, you know, represented in the being of might or in the being of Vishnu or in the be being of Christ. However you want to name it, it has that character. And that character then is something that is meaningful relative to our ex entire experience of ourself. This means that in as much as we are of the word and are of the justice and we are differentiated within that justice, any experience that we have in, manifest ex in manifestation is realized and brought home as soul matter through the process of divine justice, divine judgment. So when it says in Christianity that Christ is the judge of the quick and the dead, uh, it is talking about that there is a level of consciousness that is so impartial that if we associate ourselves with it, we arrive at a way of being known even as we are known from a realm of impartial universal truth and that that judgment is the way literally that it is that our experience is built into our spiritual nature as soul or as it becomes manifest as conscience in the heart. So like when they're weighing the heart, they're talking about a very, very, very deep process and that uh, no individual can possibly judge, not even in an individual that is individuated to be able to say, I am that I am, because this goes beyond I am to that in which I am is born. And only that can produce the kind of... So you understand what I'm trying to say? That not only then are we brought to blinding light by an act of feeling, but uh, it is a very auto-judicial process. And it's not whipping ourselves or beating ourselves or flagellating ourselves and thinking that's conscience, but it is a watching of everything as we do it. 
And that watching is called a self-remembering. And it's remembering from that which goes beyond the self. There is a state that we can come to, and in that state we are in a virgin-like state, and we watch all of the other processes that we do in life. We live, in, in a way, in a parallelism, so that when we're way on the bottom here and we think we're making plans and carrying things out, then we are doing other things on other parallels. And when we get to the to the that light which impregnates them all, when we're in that, which is the stuff out of which everything else is made, which is the word that gives everything else meaning, it's, uh, when we're in that, we can watch the whole business. and we can, we can watch the slow little bits of every day, but at the same time we can watch, ponder some ideas that develop over tens, if not hundreds of years uh, as as we as we grow, I know Sharad would say we call that nervo kelpo samadhi, but it is that kind of experience that we are uh, uh, trying to be self-born in. And that it's very hard to even uh, say much about it. So we come to Mai's Hall of Justice, and uh, it uh, has some interesting symbols in it. The, uh, there are two doors, and each of the doors have names. There is a right-hand door and a left-hand door, an active door or a passive receptive door. And when you get into the hall, there are, here's one of those numbers that comes up again and again, there are 42 judges in the hall. And the first thing the candidate for initiation or the dead person has to do is has to go through a confession, but not a confession of what the candidate did, but what the candidate didn't do. And you have to know all of these things and say that I didn't do all these things, even though you really did. <laughs> you understand this? It's so paradoxical because from the transcendental level, even our gross mistakes have an illusory not doing quality, whereas from this point of view, it looks like we're doing them. And the only way we can build the essence in is when we can bring our consciousness and say not do or better would be, say, to undo. So the first thing you do is you go through this whole confession to the 42 judges, uh, 21 on either side, of all the things you didn't do, even though you did do them, and this purifies you. I think one judge would be enough. <laughs> no, it, it was uh, really an ordeal that... Uh, uh, you... you, you you know, the, the whole quality, this, this is the retrospective principle. And it's a retrospective principle where even though the consequences on these planes of something that we have initiated may have been horrible, the confession of them or the undoing of them or the re-remembering of them and saying, I have not or I will not do that, is the way that they get neutralized and that they get taken out. It represents the whole, the real reality is in the spirit. And when we confess to the spirit, we still feel all the feelings or refeel the feelings the same way, but they're in a way that can be taken into the light spirit. In the Hall of Might is a divinity with its arms stretched out over the whole, there's a lake above the whole ceiling and painted in the ceiling of the whole uh, of the, it's not a net picture, there's a lake and there is a uh, divinity with enormously long arms that to go around the whole lake and that is indicative of the fact that the word goes as far as the consciousness 
or the will of God goes. Then, even before you get in, you have to get past uh, the dog, Hermanubis, uh, which is a guardian. You have to uh, objectify things. Before you can de-objectify things and universalize them in light, you have to objectify, you have to be watchful. One of the only things that's repeated uh, numerous times in the Bible is the hour cometh as a thief in the night and therefore be watchful. And that watchfulness is like the consciousness of Tihuri. Oh, we haven't even got to that yet. We're almost into an hour and a half already. Uh, but the guardian represents the objectification of our bestiality. And, uh, okay, I, 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 this is going to be way too long. So... Uh, I don't, know, I don't know what to say. I don't want to go on for another time with this. As, as exciting as it is, it would get to be way too much. And after you have passed the dog and have said, yes, watchfully, I am these things, then you meet the little guy. He's pictured really as portrayed as really small. He's the ape that sits on top of the scales. And the ape is seen as a backstop. The two animals that are associated with Tehudi, Tehudi is associated himself with the ibis, but the, his two associates are the uh, ape and the dog. The dog represents the cunning but forward-going quality of our human consciousness. Dogs among animals are extremely well developed to the point that they are reaching forward to a human-like state. In fact, they are the only animals that will give up their instinct in order to serve humans. They have become that far civilized or that far brought into our consciousness. Uh, in the next step up from the animal kingdom. The ape represents the backstop because the ape from an uh, occult point of view represent humans that have degenerated and gone back. And it's when you face the ape, like when you say you're aping something, when you face the ape, you have to face the poss possibility that you might go back. And this is a terrible thing that you might retrograde, that you might fail and go back, backwards in evolution rather than forwards. And so then, so that's, that's the reminder that is before you. And you have to go through a uh, positive confession. And with that positive confession, uh, you say all sorts of really strange things, many of which are found in the book of Revelations. You say, I have come through the field of the grasshoppers, and I have bathed with the sailors of Ray. Uh, many, uh, I don't know what all of those things mean. Uh, I think I understand what bathing, uh, bathing with the sailors of Ray means. It means, uh, in fact, letting go of self and floating back into the realm in faith in the realm of uh, ma'at as the word. But then you are weighed the essence of the essence when it has been built in by the uh, uh, purgatorial and the heaven-like remembrances. It get built, gets built into conscience and then uh, forth the uh, fourth Tehudi is the judge. He's the scorekeeper, and he reckons it, and he writes it all down. And uh, then you get to go past the devourer of souls in the Antigrana worlds. All right. That brings us right to uh, 
the second half of the podcast. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. That brings us to Tehuti. I want to talk about one more thing with Ma'it. Ma'it clearly is a representative, is a Venus type of being, and she carries the Venus symbol, which was called the Ankh. Uh, you know, they carried, all, many of the gods carried an Ankh. They had an exhibit here about uh, over 15 years ago in which they had Ankhs made out of uh, lapis and things like that from early Greece. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, down in, it was down in the library. It was a, a, a sensational thing. But the Ankh is the Venus symbol. But it, to the Egyptians, they associated it with Ma'at because it was the symbol of life as much as it was the symbol of love, and it was about the whole life spirit. In some, I want to just give you some quotes about Ma'at. Uh, Ma'at is called the daughter of Re, the eye of Re, meaning to say that she is the seer into existence of the light. Here's some other statements right from scriptures. Osiris carries along the earth in his train by Ma'at. Osiris was the lord of the underworld who in from inside of the earth carried the earth along the way by Ma'at because Ma'at was the way. And it is by our constant being drawing, drawn to Ma'at that we guide our lives along the path. It's really interesting, the whole principle of having a divine being to emulate that we can't see, but that we home in on, and that we tune in on, and we grope along in the dark, which is really great light, that we get carried along in, uh, in, our, in our life in a way that is much different than if we tried to follow a road map. You know, if you take the roadmap view of life, you plan. The plan is already there. You don't have to do that much planning. Some of it you have to do, but not for the essential spiritual things. All you do is home in on the, on the ideal of light, and you automatically carry it along, as it says here, in, in his train. Osiris carries the earth along in his train by Ma'at. In fact, the uh, candidate was given uh, this admonition, Know thy steps by Ma'at. Or, it even goes so far as to say, the course of Ra is determined by Ma'at. Which brings us to another side of it. This is the way. When you say that uh, one follows the way, one follows the way by being tuned in to the life of it. And then it goes on to say, Ray liveth by Ma'at, the beautiful. And it's sort of like there is a life, there's a beauty in that life, and that Ray lives into existence through that. This is very much like Freya's apples. Remember that all the gods are kept alive by eating Freya's apples? All right. Tihuti. Almost everything that we know about Tihuti there are not a lot of stories. Now, unfortunately, there are many, many, many stories about all of the divinities that we've been talking about, but those aren't translated. Almost all of what is known from Egyptian mythology and religion, they, they just the, the Egyptologists have translated all of the uh, high ritual in all of the, you know, like the books of the dead and the books of the pylons and the books of creation and things like that. But all of the little anecdotes and stories like we had when we looked in uh, uh, Hindu mythology, we had all of great stories. They're not translated from Egyptian because nobody's taken the time to do that. So all we have is the formal literature, which is, you know, and this is especially true with Tihuti, all we know is comes from mostly from funeral texts. 
And funeral texts aren't really funeral texts. They are uh, formulae for initiation. Tehudi, like Hermes Mercury, is one of the only divinities that's capable of going into the underworld. And uh, this is true in all mythologies, especially in the Egyptian mythologies. In fact, Tehudi is known more as an underworld god than an above the world. And this is saying, I believe, that since Tehudi represents reason, that even the experience of the life spirit even that is subject to reason because reason couldn't have been born out of it unless it were there in the first place. And so when the leader or the more active guider through the underworld is Tehudi, that is to say that reason or logic or clear thought the focus where things are brought into time and born in individual thoughts being produced one after another, where we actually walk this path by delineating one thought after another, after another, after another. That principle of reason is both the birth and death of the life of Ma'at, but that principle of reason is necessary for anything to be accomplished by the gods or for the gods or back into the gods is done by reason. It's the chief of all tools. But reason is a deathly activity. Just like we saw in the Hindu mythology, Shiv was the uh, god that gave birth time. Time is a deathly process. It stops the awareness of eternity. At the same time, it gives birth to it in actuality. And when you think about things, you have brought them to a state of completion. And when they are completed, they have served no other purpose but that their experience must be built back as new life into the one. So the whole activity of Tehudi is a process of thinking, and thinking is a killing, deathly process, even right down to what happens in our physiology. Every time we think, we kill brain cells. That's why the, yeah, the real, yeah. And you know that uh, one glass of beer or one glass of wine or one shot kills as many brain cells as one day's worth of thinking. So every time you take a drink, you've taken one end off, one day off the other end. Uh, you shortened it and you brought it back. You may live long, but the possibility of uh, uh, being able to remain on senile in those latter days is less likely. Uh, that you may live long, but you may not live as well. In fact, that's what all the studies show now, that you know, you'll live as long as you're going to live, but it might, it might be a very terrible type of living if you haven't lived well. So all of thought then is a concluding process. When we think we come to conclusions. Now that's a really dangerous thing because if you get stuck in the conclusion, then it's hard to take the next step. Do you, you understand what I'm trying to say? That if one gets too bound up and too internalized in the process of thinking, uh, apart from the process of feeling or of life of mind, if one gets in the uh, fourth like consciousness, one then dies. Now Tehudi is, he's got the tablet and he's inscribing results of the weighing of the soul. 
the weighing of the experience. That inscription is a deathly process, and it is a backward process. I don't know how to say it any other way. I don't know if any of you ever saw that wonderful movie on Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, he has, he's going across what is called the, what is it, it's called the devil's, not the kitchen, not the, I think it's the devil's anvil. And he's, and they're going across it from very early in the morning. He's leading all these Arabs across uh, because the Turks, uh, together with the Germans, are uh, uh, massacring Arabs because they want to gain power over the Arabian Peninsula and such like this. This is in the Second World War. And Lawrence of Arabia unites them and takes them right across the heart of the desert of, uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia. And to do this is a very tricky proposition because there are all of these clans that have warfare with each other. And in the Quran, it is, uh, it, the whole idea is that vengeance is not only a right, it is a duty. So that if somebody of another clan kills somebody of your clan, you have the duty to kill somebody of their clan. And so he has all of these clans sort of united in a tenuous coalition, and they're going across the desert. And what happens is uh, one man gets left behind. And Lawrence, being an Englishman, gets left behind in the morning. And Lawrence, being an Englishman, says, we got to save that man. And the chieftains tell him, as it comes from the Quran, it is written that he's meant to die. Meaning to say that once something is written, it's final. This is where literalism comes from. Because when something is written, it is finalized. In fact, this is where writer's blocks come from. Uh, I almost hate to write anything because unless you have enough mind, when you start writing, you get it you you get it set in your mind that you've reached the conclusion, and then you can't take the next step on the path. So Lawrence of Arabia goes back all alone in the middle of the day in all of this tremendous heat, and he carries the man back, and the man lives. And but then later on there's a squabble, and he kills somebody from an opposing clan, the very man that was saved. And Lawrence is then in a position that vengeance is demanded. And all of his people are going to die. They're going to kill each other off. Because this is clan warfare is like this. So there's only one solution, and that is that vengeance comes from an outside party. So Lawrence of Arabia has to take a gun and put it to the head of the man that he's gone across 120 degree temperature desert sand and he has to blow his brains out. Otherwise he's going to lose, every, otherwise everybody is going to be lost. But uh, that whole notion, Arabic culture is, a lot of the Arabic words with all of the cues and cues that sound like K's and things like that, all come from Egypt. Ancient Egypt, all of the cultures, much as the, the Arabs, hate, the uh, Muslims hate ancient Egypt, and they did as much as they could to, uh, uh, to uh, desecrate, well, like they desecrated the Great Pyramid. Uh, they took all of the beautiful limestone that used to be on it. It used to be smooth. It used to be precision smooth. And they took that all off of it to make mosques. Uh, you know, and <laughs> yeah, all right, it's, it's, but uh, as much as they hit the ancient Egyptians, their culture, culture is impregnated with it. So there is something about the process of writing that is deathly, but it's also retrograde because the whole process of thinking is a backward process. In the first place, when one thinks concretely, one is asking a question. And that question forms a resonant vacuum. 
And in that resonant vacuum is where the word vibrates. And every the life of everything that comes into existence is forming a flute for the standing waves of ma'et to resonate into the phenomenal worlds in which we exist. All the vibrations of every atom and such like that is the process of asking a question. And that asking a question, if you've ever thought, it isn't the way the Aristotelians think it is. You don't, this doesn't follow this, doesn't follow this, doesn't follow this. You always think backwards. You ask a question and you get an intuitive hit and then the logic works back to it. So even the pro- procession forward on the way that is the way of Ma'e is actually a backward process. So the reinscribing or the rethinking process where uh, uh, Foth is writing things in the book of the dead is a backward process and the whole uh, process of thinking is a backward process. Now, I'm trying to be very, very practical in this because in our prayers, people think that, you know, like the profane think that praying is asking for something like I want a lot of money or I want this thing or that thing. But if we're praying and we're asking for light and we're asking for life, that is asking a question and that asking of a question is forming a concept of the thinker as someone receptive to the life of the life spirit of mind. And that's literally what uh, uh, praying is. It is a kind of thinking that gives us the character of the divine, that gives us a self that is based on the stuff of which is filled of the life of spirit of selfness. And so in order to enter into the inner worlds, it is a process of writing, if you like, but it is writing backwards, and it is writing backwards by asking questions. I'm skipping a lot of the details because I want to get to the ideas, of course, and not all the details. Tehudi is also the namer. He's called the Lord of Divine Words. Not the word, but of divine words. And so he names everything and he finalizes everything because once you have name, the name of something, you have power over it. That's something that all mystics of all ages know, that the speaking of a name is the finalization process. He is known as the judge of two gods. That is Set and Horos. Water and fire, Set represents nature, and Horos represents spirit or fire, and they're in this constant struggle, life and death struggle, that uh, Horos defeats Set time and time and time again. And Tihuri, known as the judge of that, is literally saying that Tihuri is right at the apex of the, uh, where the two triangles meet, where the transcendent, which is fire, which is spirit, meets with water or meets with nature and spirit in nature or spirit in matter. The struggle between the two of them that we've been talking about from time to time to time, the judge of that, which means the thinker who thinks spirit into matter and overcomes matter, and then matter overwhelms the spirit so that it falls asleep again, and the judge then of matter overwhelming uh, where, where things go back the other way, the whole process of thinking or of watching, uh, of being an eye of the spirit in the process, Forever and ever. <laughs> They're going to be buying tapes forever and ever. Okay. But you get the, you know, the uh, watcher. There is, within this triangle, there is a virgin spirit that goes even beyond Ra. 
or beyond ray. And that gets focused in our body at the same place where the seed atom of the mind is, right behind the frontal sinus. And we literally watch things into existence. I talked a little bit about that earlier, but so I don't want to go uh, too much further with that. Tihuri is also known as the uh, reckoner of heaven. He measures the heavens, because you, by measuring it, is actually carrying it out. He's the counter of stars. He's the enumerator. How many, how often, that's what sets things spinning. How often does it turn around? That's what the uh, enumerator is. He's also the enumerator and measurer of the earth. Again, meaning to say that he's two-sided. Uh, to the Egyptians, Tihuri meant the mind total, both abstract mind and concrete mind, because they both meant mentioned, uh, they both meet in uh, the heart of the mind. It is the knower of divine speech. That is the knower of the universal principles, the ideas that are behind everything. And he is also known as twice greatest because he's greater than the transcendental beings because He's the one that has the power to make them manifest. But he's also greater than nature because he can see beyond nature into the spirit. And he's also known as thrice greatest because he is the focus of the threefold spirit. And this is the way that he has come to be known in all of Western culture. He is known as thrice greatest or thrice blessed Hermes. Uh, it is he that is, as we said before, he is the divine of the city of Kemenu, from which our word alchemy, which is known as hermetics, come from all of those things. He wrote, again, 42 books. Uh, <laughs> this is the third time that 42 has come up. There were 42 gnomes, and there are 42 uh, judges in the Hall of Ma'at, and now there are the 42 books of Hermes. Ten of the books are books of laws, gods, and priests. Ten of them are of services, offerings, sacrifices, worship. Uh, ten of them are on history and geography, which are the same thing to him. Uh, four of them are on astronomy and astrology, and uh, two of them are religious compositions, and the uh, last six are on medicine. Only one of them exists, and that's one of those, the one that talks about the uh, tarot cards and such like that, the symbolism. All the rest have been completely lost. Um, How much more do you want to go for? Earl <laughs> says, not too much. Uh, the 42 is 6 times 7. Meaning to say that if 7 represents the number of manifest completion. And Hermes, see, Egypt itself was based on as above so below, what has gone before in heaven will follow after on earth. Know this and rejoice. Because the rejoicing is what makes the creation possible and the appreciation is what uh, builds it back into the spirit. But um, if we take as we have done before and bring the two triangles together, we have the symbol of the macrocosm. The point then is in the center. If there are a manifest seven for each of the legs of the triangle, we have 42. And then the focal point becomes Hermes, becomes the mind, become, it's in the heart of it. All of Egypt is built that way. 
literally the cities and such were laid out that way. But remember, there was Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. So when it's talking about the triangle of the spirit that is materializing in matter or the matter that is spiritualizing into spirit, that is talking about the two triangles and giving the seven principles of each of them for 42. So Egypt itself was a representation of the entire universe, of the entire macrocosm. So when they talk about upper and lower Egypt, they're not just talking about positions on the uh, Nile. They're talking about positions on the spiritual Nile, uh, which is the flow through the primordial atom. It's a, it's, it's a really very, very beautiful thing. Uh, it is, uh, uh, Tehudi was also called the chief of the five, meaning the uh, four cardinal points met in the center. So he was the fifth point. And he was also known as the chief of the seven in orientation, up, down, forward, back, right, and left. And then right in the center is the seventh. Again, the three-dimensional space having the uh, uh, six other points going on. Uh, going out from it. Boy, I think I'm going to have to skip a lot of, uh, of things here. Oh, I'm just going to have, there's just too much, too, too much that I have to say. And it's not going to, uh, yeah, it would be too much to develop it because I'd have to start all over again talking about a cosmological story. And I, I think it would be way too long. I just, you know, I still got more. Uh, we haven't gotten to the practical stuff yet. Uh, the name Tehudi, we'll just, I'll just skip some of these things. Again, Tehudi is the Ibis god, which this time is the slender-legged uh, god, which pecks down into the waters. Uh, down into the regions of Set. The name Tehudi comes from the very ancient word Tek, T-E-K-H, which is where our technology comes from, technos, yes, and where Tek, the, uh, uh, the language, typesetting language comes from. Tek was a source of a weight, not only is this little pot that holds the uh, soul uh, a symbol of the heart and the vessel of the conscience uh, that is weighed against the uh, feather, it was a measurement of weight. And so this is the source of the uh, sacrifice of the heart. Boy, I, I do remember last year when we were talking about the Sangrio. Remember the uh, Galahad as he's riding, no, it's uh, Boers as he's riding along, looks in the tree and he sees the bird uh, pecking down into its heart and feeding its uh, little ones from its heart. We talked about that being the first case in the Western world of that symbol, which later on became the Rosicrucian symbol or the Masonic symbol. Well, I now find it in ancient Egypt uh, that the sacrifice of the heart, which is the focus into the heart of existence, because to the Egyptians, the center was not only in the head, it was more associated with the heart, and that the ibis pecking into its heart in order to feed its young, in order to feed its creations, that is, that is a symbol of, again, asking and going to your heart with everything that you've got in order to bring new life to the world. And it is a sacrifice of all personal existence, but out of that is where all self-becoming is born because you can't know yourself unless you're going to the well and knowing yourself as the thinker, and you can't think unless you have something to offer. And so... Uh, the name Tehudi then has to do with the sacrifice uh, of the heart. 
We've me already mentioned a little bit about the monkey god and about Anubis. Um, let's just very quickly pass on to a whole another interpretation of everything we've looked at. We've been trying to look at the nature of Ma'at and Tihudi as representatives of the life spirit and of the divine, of the human spirit that is a Vishnu and Shiv. And the, we've been looking at it in a very transcendental sense of being self-born. But it is possible and very valuable to look at it in a very down-to-earth practical way. And if we're trying to learn to become self-generated, self-created, spontaneous uh, children of Ra as twice-born spiritual selves, then we have to look at them in a more phenomenal sense. All of the transcendental things need the phenomenal. So let's very quickly look at uh, the phenomenal. It's kind of hard to be completely transcendental because to be completely transcendental, I couldn't even be talking. We would have to be realizing on the level of life spirit and human spirit consciousness. And that's a little bit steep for us. As, you know, if we're lucky if we even get uh, a hint of something like that in our life. Let's look at it phenomenally and use the hermetic axiom as above, so below. The uh, divine spirit can be associated with Pluto, with the will. The life spirit, which is pure intuition, can be associated with Uranus, and the human spirit uh, which has the super logic and ties all things together can be associated with the thoughtful kind of intuition. But we know in the phenomenal sense that ray is associated with the sun. Then if we take the lower octaves of Uranus and Neptune, both the sun and Pluto are planets of power, the lower octave of Uranus is Venus, and the lower octave of Neptune is Mercury. These planets, Venus and Mercury, are known as inner planets because they are within the orbit of the Earth. They're sometimes called inferior planets because they never uh, become opposite the Sun. They never get to that superior position. But it's really interesting, if you think about it, that they never are far away from the sun. So in the night and in the morning when we see the sun set and rise, it has potentially on one side of it and the other Venus and Mercury. Venus is the planet of love, and love gives us promise. And so it's like Uranus, it is a planet of the future, because things are born out of love. Mercury is the planet of thought, and it's concrete thinking, it is the backward mover, and so it is the death dealer, and so it is the planet of memory and of the past. So, in order to come to self-realization in the highest spiritual sense, we don't have to be completely transcendental about it. Said in a very simple way, any time that we freely manifest the love principle and see the beauty in things so that they're born anew, seeing them in a new way. Any time that we consciously give love to a circumstance, we are performing at least the preparatory work, if not the fulfilling work, of being self-born. 
Also, if every time we look at life, we look at it new and kill it by thinking about new thoughts about it and dealing with death in that fashion, every time we do that, we are also working on the process of guiding and giving light to Ray. There is a uh, preparatory part in the Lysis by Plato in which uh, the uh, student is being shown different people. He's being shown the muleteer who whips, and he's being shown the uh, uh, domestic who takes care of the young man uh, and the young man says, no, I can't be the muleteer, and no, I can't be the domestic. And uh, he is asked, what can you do? And he said, I can write the words however I want to, and I can draw the images however I want to. This is literally, if you're looking at Plato, this is literally an astrology lesson that the muleteer is Saturn and all of the different beings in the household that are being enumerated for the young man are the planetary qualities. The only ones that are personal to him, the sun represents self and the internal planets which are never far from the sun and are always there as adjuncts that are necessary to the sun are feeling and thinking, our loving and reasoning. Therefore, in order for us to know ourselves by the conscious process of giving love, every time we love, we open up the possibility for life to flow through us. Every time we think thoughts, we begin to see the self as the thinker of thoughts. The things that are most available to us to willfully do, to self-consciously do, are to stop and think or to bring love flowingly to a situation. And uh, that is the necessity that is the guidance, those are the things that result in the spontaneous, creative, self-born ray out of the frozen potential of what we could be, which is what Pluto represents. Pluto represents frozen water. Scorpio is frozen water. And every time that we uh, fixed water, Every time that we perform these two deeds of self-conscious thinking and of self-conscious loving, we are giving birth to ourselves in a higher or more high uh, manner. And I think that this is what the admonition was to the candidates to the mysteries of Ray in the Hall of Justice. All right. We've looked at three different trinities of Ray. Next time we'll look at one more trinity of Ray with an enormous side trip that is well overdue and uh, it's something we haven't at all talked about yet that is uh, primal to all mythology and we'll talk about that next time. We'll probably we'll be talking about the trinity of Ray, Hathor, and Horus. Uh, and remember, the Egyptians do things by multiple tr trinities, and that's what we're going to do. We have two more to go, because the, but the last one will result in the getting us finally to hierarchy. It was fun. No.